Um, what I've thought is since it's a purely educational back uh, setup, so I thought I will teach about uh, the fundamentals of light microscopy and touch it briefly on the system what we have at uh, DY Patel, basically. Yeah, so without uh, wasting much time, so I'll just um, start with <clears throat> a small introduction about Dr. size. Uh, um, may I interrupt? May I request yes, you to switch on your camera if possible? Of course I can. Is Thank it okay you, now? Sir. Yeah, sure. Thank you yeah. so much. So um, a small introduction about Zeiss. Um, so Carl Zeiss as a, a microscopic company is a little over 172 years old. And it is one of the uh, only company that caters towards the complete spectrum of microscopy. When I say complete spectrum, I uh, refer to the light microscopy, electron microscopy, and the medium ion microscopy. So what we will be discussing about is today um, somewhere around here, which is called the wide field system or the uh, light microscopy part. Um, I'll teach you through the, uh, the basics of a microscope and as practical as possible uh, in this session. <clears throat> now, we all have seen um, light microscope, we all have used light microscope. So uh, microscope itself is the instrument that lets us see uh, really minute particles and objects um, that are un un otherwise not visible by the unaided eye. So uh, the microscope, um, the Greek um, name of micros um, is for small and scopian is to observe small um, objects, basically. Microscopy is a study or the science of investigating small objects using the instrument microscope, basically. But um, just visualizing or just seeing an object um, in, in modern microscopy um, is not alone uh, going to be sufficient, right? We, we have to um, capture that as an image and then process that as, um, as a data or convert that image into a data, so on and so forth. So, <clears throat> so we'll see, we'll touch about um, all these factors in a while. Um, so what you see here is one of the oldest microscope that was ever manufactured by Carl Zeiss, which is the monocular microscope, what you see. And a little later towards the, you know, um, the technology when it came up at that level, it became a binocular microscope with a revolving uh, nose piece. So if you notice here, it is a single fixed objective, uh, particular magnification, and there is no external light source, just a mirror, which will be reflecting the natural light basically. And then what you have here on the right side is a, is a little more complex microscope. So you have a revolving nose piece where you have three objectives and much more complicated stage also. Now, when I said we will discuss about light microscope, um, what is light basically? Um, so it's an <clears throat> electromagnetic spectrum. And what we consider as the visible light ranges between the wavelengths 380 nanometer to 700 nanometer. So that is what um, we humans can um, see as light. So the smallest wavelength within our visible spectrum is about 380 nanometers, roughly towards the indigo range. Um, as you can see, the wavelength is much more smaller while <clears throat> towards the lower wavelength here. And then when we go towards the red, you can see the wavelength is much more larger. Um, the significance here is smaller wavelength, higher energy, uh, larger wavelength, poor energy. Extremely critical when we are working with live sam samples or samples that are, or fluorescent samples that are uh, very photosensitive because uh, when we start imaging with a low wavelength light, um, it will cause much more damage and then it causes to phototoxicity and photo bleaching. People don't realize is that uh, when actually people see that the sample is bleached, um, the photo damage has already happened. So photo bleaching is an effect of photo damage. So we have to be really critical when we actually use uh, microscopes for certain um, purpose and we have to have a clear cut idea of how we are going to utilize the microscope to the best of its um, potential without damaging or um, limiting the damage as much as possible onto the sample, especially when we are working with a live cell sample. Now, <clears throat> as I told light microscope, so light is the main part here. So light behaves as the messenger. Uh, what, what does it carry is it actually carries all the information that is uh, that has been coming from the sample or object of your uh, interest. And it translates these um, into an image that is what we perceive um, or capture as an image. So please note that uh, the user never actually looks directly at a sample through a microscope. It is always the image of the specimen is what we always look at. So it can be a virtual image, it can be upright or an inverted image depending on the, the build of the microscope. But <clears throat> basically we actually never look directly at the specimen. We only create the image of a specimen within the microscope body, and then we make it visible <clears throat> either to the, through the eyepiece 
or through the camera port where, where we can capture it as an image. So it is absolutely critical that we manage this light as best as possible so that we preserve as much information as possible that the light is carrying along with that. Yeah. <clears throat> now, um, light is of dual uh, property. We all know that. So light is neither a wave nor a particle. So when we talk about the wave nature of the light, um, so here's a simple um, sine wave diagram. So you can see the, the distance between two crest or two trough will represent the wavelength of the light. The, the height of the wave will represent the, the amplitude of the wave will actually represent the brightness of the image, what we get, so on and so forth. And we can explain a certain contrast techniques, like how we create contrast in the microscope on the basis of the wave nature of the light. And then when we talk about some other um, contrast techniques, precisely uh, fluorescence contrast technique, we consider light to be the particle form, pockets of energy or photons, basically. Now, uh, this is essential when we understand the principle of fluorescence and when we understand how phase contrast or bright field image works, we understand the wave nature of the light, basically. Yeah. <clears throat> so here is a um, tabulation of the wavelengths and the corresponding color, almost around 400 or anywhere between 380 to 400, you'll have the um, ultraviolet range or little after that will be the violet and the longest, um, what we can perceive close to 700 will be red. Anything above red uh, will be the infrared. So there are there are um, users and research scientists who work on um, far red dyes, um, something like um, a cyan in seven, a psi seven fluorescent dye will typically excite close to around 600 nanometer and it will emit around um, greater than 700 nanometer. In that case, uh, please don't expect to see any fluorescence in the eyepiece because we cannot realize that wavelength. A good camera, a good monochrome camera, can capture that as a as an image, basically. And it is a, it is also very important that we know the excitations and the emissions of the fluorescent dyes, what we are going to work with, and and their range um, that is also going to be useful, especially uh, not necessarily while you are actually uh, prepared the sample, but these are critical things that have to be considered at the time of designing an experiment. Um, I would not choose um, two fluor if if I had the cho uh, choice. I would not choose two fluorescence proteins that are very close to each other in their emission spectra. Say, for example, I would not go with a cyan and green in the same sample unless and until it is absolutely you know unavoidable kind of. Thing. Now <clears throat> we have all gone through this um, basic properties of light um, or properties of light um, when it interacts with different mediums. So you have absorption. Reflection, refraction, and diffraction. I'm not going to teach what is absorption, reflection, and everything. I'm just going to go point out like how we utilize these properties of light inside a microscope. So absorption is reduction of wavelength when it passes through an optical component. Um, so a simple example is, um, say for example, when we have a halogen 100 uh, lamp house, which is typically a yellow light source, we place a blue filter where the yellow color light gets converted into more pleasant white color background. So that blue filter has the property of absorption. It, it filters out particular wavelengths and then what you get is a more or less a white light. The other example will be the excitation filters. What we use in fluorescence microscopy um, also has the property of absorption. So these different properties of light when it interacts with medium is actually utilized to the most when we consider building a microscope or when we actually uh, design a microscope for that instance. The other property is reflection, very simple. Um, light, when it hits a polished surface, um, depending on the angle of incidence, the angle of uh, reflection will be um, equal, uh, opposite and equal. So depending on, say, for example, in a microscope, when we use this property, um, a simple example inside a microscope is when we deviate the light between the eyepieces and to the camera port. There's a small mirror that comes into the beam path that will divert the light going into the camera or it will um, you know, send the light through to the eyepiece for the observer to uh, or the user to observe the, um, the sample through the eyepiece basically. Now refraction is very critical. So refraction is bending of light when it leaves one medium and enters into the other medium. A very common day example is a, a straw that is looked through the glass of water. So the straw looks pretty much straight um, as long as it touches the water. The reason is the refractive index of air here is one. The refractive index of water is much more higher, 1.33. Light bends when it leaves, a, a, a enters into a higher a refractive index medium. So that is the reason straw looks bent. 
this is the property of light that we utilize when we actually use oil immersion objectives. So when we use oil immersion objectives, we exploit the property of refraction to gain more light coming into the objective. I'll discuss that in a, in a minute now. Now, <clears throat> the other property is diffraction. Um, very simple. Um, light scatters when it passes through edges or light scatters when it passes through an obstacle, basically. So here the obstacle could be um, the, the sample or the components within the sample. Say, for example, if you're talking about uh, a mitochondria or a nucleus within the cell and then that scatters the light and then we have to capture this diffracted light. Now one thing to understand here is if you consider um, this part here where um, the light is, <clears throat> not sure if the marker is on. so if you see here if you consider this to be like a small dam and then this is a shutter that is open, um, the water is gushing out in a radially diffusing manner. So this is exactly similar to what happens to light when it passes through a slit. Uh, we, we probably would remember that um, Young's double slit experiment. So if we have two such openings, then the diffracted light will meet at a particular point at particular intervals and that meeting or, um, you know, um, inter that is what is called as interference. Depending on the, uh, the property of these two waves, whether it is in phase or not in phase, we create constructive interference or we create destructive interference. So this is an actual picture of diffraction that is actually captured. So you can see the constructive and destructive interference patterns. Now, it is important for a microscope to capture the diffracted light to create image along with at least one order of diffraction. Uh, I'll come to that in a minute. What do I mean by that? So if you see here, uh, when we have two different um, organelles, say for example, within a cell that is diffracting the light, so you can see the diffraction pattern, and then the interference happens at a much smaller angle. So if you see here, the angle between zero to one is much more smaller than the angle zero to one here, when these two components are much closer to each other. What do I mean by that is, this actually relates to the resolving power of a microscope. So when you have two objects that are located at a considerably far distance from each other, then it is much more easier for the microscope to capture that as an image because the diffracting angle is much more shorter. While two objects are closely located, the diffracting angles are much more wider and it requires a much more higher um, numerical aperture objective um, to capture that as an image, basically. <clears throat> now, what do I, well, that's exactly what is here. So in order to create an image, we have to capture at least one order of diffraction so that the image is captured. So where is the image coming from? So these are the light that was scattered by say, for example, the components of a cell or, a, or of your sample that gets diffracted and interferes at different positions. And then when we capture at least one order of uh, diffraction, we will capture the image of what caused the diffraction basically. Now, so here I mentioned about <clears throat> resolution. Now, when I say the two objects are um, far away from each other, we don't need an objective with high resolving power to capture that as an image. Um, I will explain what is that. So resolution of a microscope depends on a lot of factors, primarily the wavelength of the light, what we are using and the numerical aperture of the objective that we are going to use to capture that as an image. Now, what is this numerical aperture? <clears throat> I will discuss in, a, in detail what numerical aperture is, but if you see here, this is an objective that captures both zero, one, and I'm sorry, one and two orders of diffraction. And here, this objective is not even able to capture the complete first order of diffraction, which means that this objective could not resolve these two objects as two separate objects. So just keep this in mind. I'll uh, I'll come up with the explanation in a couple of slides later. <clears throat> now, going back to the basics of why do we use a microscope? Is we all know that we want to see or you know document or capture a picture of something that we cannot um, see using our unaided eye, right? Now, for this or for microscope to work um, to the best of its ability, it has to satisfy three conditions. One is magnification. Two is resolution and three has to create a contrast. Now, upon fulfillment of all three criteria, the microscope will become functional. So all three are equally important and has to be satisfied at any given point for the user to be you know, um, satisfied with whatever image or 
um, observation they are going to make. Now, magnification is very simple. Now, <clears throat> magnification is uh, when we create a picture or an image, um, the size proportional to the actual size of the object will be given as the magnification. That's a very simple um, explanation we can give for magnification. Now, magnification is not actually so simple when it comes to the microscope because let's take a simple example. Let's assume that there is an elephant that is standing right in front of us about, say, about five feet in front of us. <clears throat> now, the observer standing right in front of front of the elephant, or let's say uh, we are standing right in front of it, then we can see the elephant very clearly. The, the size of the elephant really massive. Uh, we can see the fine patterns that are going through the trunks and probably we can see the hair standing on the elephant's head kind of thing. Now assume that the elephant has walked away from you backwards about, about 100 feet, let's say about 100 or 50 feet, whatever it is. Now, now the elephant will all of a sudden look much more smaller than what it was appearing before, right? Now, <clears throat> the elephant did not shrink as it, shrink as it walked back, but what happened was, um, the distance between the object and the observer varied. In the first scenario, it was much closer to the observer. In the second scenario, it was much farther away from the observer. In course of this happening, what happened is that <clears throat> the angle at which the observer was viewing the object also changed. Now, when the object is much closer to the, uh, to the observer, the angle is much more wider, so the object looks much more larger. When the object travels much away from it, the viewing angle becomes smaller, which means the object will appear smaller. <clears throat> now, why am I explaining this is a lot of people think that if you pick out an objective from, let's say, brand A and put it on a brand B microscope, let's say, for example, you took out a 10x objective from brand A and then you are putting it into a brand B microscope, it does not necessarily have to be the same 10x magnification because when it was designed, it was designed for particular length of the optics, that is actually something called as their tube length, is going to match only for that particular brand and it will not definitely match for the next microscope. So these are small things that people probably don't realize, but it is definitely not going to be 10x object magnification when the image is actually created. Yeah. <clears throat> now, while we are still talking about magnification, um, again, going back to the elephant example, Let's say we walk really close to the elephant, about half a feet in front of the elephant, and we are looking at the elephant. We probably won't realize what we are looking at, right? So the similar thing can also happen in a microscope. So there is something called as useful magnification, and there is something called as empty magnification. So we don't necessarily have to um, magnify everything that we are observing to the maximum magnification that is available in the microscope. Some microscopes don't even have 100x objective unless and until the user is working on very minute objects, something like a bacteria or yeast um, samples. Other than that, we just definitely don't need a 100x objective because your 63x objective can still resolve the same level as a 100x objective because a 63x objective and 100x objective can be given or provided with the same numerical aperture. Now, like I said, <clears throat> um, what is the useful magnification? Say, for example, the rule of the thumb um, says that the useful magnification lies between 500 times a numerical aperture up to 1000 times a numerical aperture of the objective that we use. Yeah. So, for example, let's say we use an objective 10x magnification with 0 0.25 as a numerical aperture, then the useful magnification lies between 125 to 250 times. Now, how did we arrive at this? 500 into 0.25, the numerical aperture, then 1000 into 0.25, again, the numerical aperture of the objective. So it is 125 to 250 times. Likewise, if you use a 100x objective, 1.4 oil immersion objective, then the useful magnification lies between 700 to 1,400 times. Now, here's an example of not sufficient magnification, magnification that is actually useful to the observer or the user, and magnification that is not necessarily going to be useful, what we call as the empty magnification. <clears throat> now, what gives the magnification in a microscope? Um, please understand it is the objectives, but not only the objectives. So here I've put some examples of objectives that we use in a stereo microscope. What you see on the top left corner is the objectives that goes in a stereo microscope. What you see here is the objectives that goes in a compound microscope, could be upright or inverted. This one is a specific inverted microscope objective um, used typically for live cell imaging. 
and a lot of people don't understand or probably don't realize that there are several lenses that goes inside an objective so if you see here uh, you can probably see about nine or eight lenses that are arranged in a very precise positions um, that actually gives the quality of the objective uh, and also the resolving ability of the objective please note that the total magnification is always a factor of the objective magnification multiplied by the eyepiece magnification so if we use a 20x objective or a for example, with a 10x eyepiece, the total magnification is 200 times. Yeah. Now, the other important thing, um, what I wanted to discuss is the resolution of a light microscope. Um, so resolution, typical, the textbook definition is the smallest distance between two objects um, that are close to each other until, until these two can be seen as two separate objects. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so it comes from the Rayleigh's criterion or uh, Rayleigh the astronomers. So basically, when we are able to visualize two closely located objects as two separate objects, then the device or the optical system that we use to visualize that has the ability to resolve that much as the smallest distance between those two objects. Now, in microscopy, resolution is broadly classified into two types. One is the spatial resolution, the other is temporal resolution. Within the spatial resolution, which is defined by space or distance, we have two resolution. One is called lateral resolution, which is X and Y plane. The other is called axial resolution, which is X, Z or Y, Z. That is the 3D third dimension, basically going into the depth of the um, uh, um, object. Now, it is easier to achieve the lateral resolution and it is much more difficult to achieve Z resolution. Uh, typically, a wide field system like what we have as a simple inverted fluorescence microscope, we cannot define Z resolution because we would require an optical sectioning device, something like a confocal microscope, which can um, resolve uh, objects in the 3D, basically, um, which we cannot do at the moment in a wide field system. The other type of resolution is temporal resolution, which is based on time. A uh, very simple example is the time or the speed at which the camera uh, captures the image. Um, say, for example, it is defined by um, frames per second. Now, it is also critical. Uh, so, for example, if, if a user is working on a fixed sample where the sample is permanently fixed under a cover, uh, under a cover slip on a glass slide, then the user does not necessarily have to worry about, uh, you know, whether the sample is going to move or he's going to miss a uh, metabolically active dynamic. Um, within the sample. For them, um, a camera with a much more higher resolution will make more sense rather than a camera with higher speed. Now, if you consider another scenario where the user is working with live cell imaging, let's say, for example, the user wants to follow the cell division or want to capture the mitosis process, um, then uh, a 20 frames per second camera may not be sufficient. They might have to go anything above 60 frames to 100 frames per second uh, camera, basically. So that defines the temporal resolution of the system. Now, um, I don't think I'm going to go too deep into the, uh, the factors or the, the formulas here. So resolution primarily depends on the wavelength and also the numerical aperture. 0.61 is a constant, which is Rayleigh's criterion. So resolution on the lateral side will be given by 0.61 lambda by numerical aperture. On the axial, it will be 2 into n into lambda by na square. Small n is the refractive index of the medium. Say, for example, air is 1, water is 1.33, and oil is 1.518. We'll come to that in a minute. Now, please understand, you don't necessarily have to know these formulas by heart. But what you should uh, probably realize is it is easier to achieve lateral resolution, and it is much more difficult to achieve axial resolution. Likewise, when we achieve lateral resolution, say, for example, we achieve a lateral resolution of about 250 nanometers, then the system's axial resolution will be at least two times poorer than the lateral resolution, meaning it will be 250 into 2 will be minimum 500 nanometer or larger. So when we define resolution, the smaller the number, the better is the resolution. So 250 nanometer is better result than 500 nanometer resolution. Yeah. Now, this is what is explained in this image. So if we achieve 200 nanometer as a lateral resolution, then the best possible um, in the Z or axial resolution is achievable is only 500 nanometer, assuming this is an oil immersion objective. Okay. Now I've been talking about uh, resolution a lot, and then um, I wanted to explain a little bit on the numerical aperture, which is very, very uh, important in terms of light microscopy. 
So let's say we have a light source, which is something like that, and the light is, uh, which can be a halogen lamp, and the light is coming down in this direction. Now we place a lens in the light path, and then this lens collects the light and it focuses at a point away from the uh, lens, basically. That will be the focal point of the lens. Now, the lens that is collecting the light from the light source will be called as the <clears throat> condenser, and the, the point at which uh, it focuses will become your specimen plane. That is where we typically place our sample. And then the sample will diffract the light or basically will scatter the light. And that light can be collected by another lens, which becomes the objective. Okay. Now, numerical aperture can be defined as if you draw a line through the middle of this, and then if you measure the angle, then numerical aperture can be calculated as n into sine of that particular angle, basically where n is the refractive index of the medium. As I told before, refractive index is the speed of light in space divided by the speed of light in the substance. For example, light travels at 300,000 uh, meters per second in, um, in space divided by 225, which is the speed in water. Then the um, refractive index of water is 1.33. So these are constants anyways. Now, light does not only diffract in a given um, way. It is isotropic. It diffracts all over the place. So let's say, for example, these dotted lines are the ways um, that the light diffracts. And let's assume that we want to capture this particular angle also. So what we do is we move the lens a little closer so that we collect more diffracted light. Why, why are we interested in collecting more diffracted light is because if this angle increases, the numerical aperture value will also increase, which means it is better resolution. The more the diffracted light we collect, the more information about what caused the diffraction is what we collect. Basically, that is the resolution. Now, when I move the objective closer to the sample, what I compromise is something called as a working distance. Typically, the distance away from the specimen to the front lens. I'll come to that in a minute. Let us say we want to capture even the largest angle possible. So what we do is we place a drop of oil on the sample and then this diffracted light is going to be refracted, basically bending of light, and it, going, it is going to bend towards the opening of the objective or the front lens of the objective. But leaving the oil there and leaving the objective here again makes the medium in between the oil and the objective as air. So the light will path its origin, follow its original path. It will again go back in its original direction, which, which is what we don't want. So what we typically do is that we bring the lens and then we touch the lens with the oil. That is the only reason why we touch the oil of an oil objective uh, lens. So that the medium between the sample and the objective remains a constant, which is uh, which is higher refractive index, obviously the NA will be larger. Yeah. Now, as I told before, the larger the numerical aperture, the smaller is the working distance. So what is the working distance? The working distance is the distance between the sample and the objective. I'll give you a simple example. If a user is working on multi-well plate with a plastic bottom, they cannot use an oil immersion objective to work with a plastic bottom multi-well plate because the thickness of the bottom thickness alone is around one millimeter. So your objective will not have the working distance to find focus above the bottom of your uh, multi-well plate. Instead, if you use a 10x objective, you can still find the sample within the tissue culture flask or a multi-well plate because they, they are placed at a much larger distance and they have a larger working distance because their numerical aperture is smaller. So what we understand is larger than numerical aperture, better is the resolution, but poorer will be the working distance. Smaller than numerical aperture, poorer is the resolution, but better will be the working distance. So it depends on what the user wants to do. They can select uh, either a long working distance objective or a high resolution objective, typically. Okay. So I'll just quit through. So here, um, most people uh, confuse between upright and inverted microscope. So the only way to classify an upright or an inverted microscope is the position at which the objectives are uh, placed. If the objectives are above the sample stage, then it becomes an upright microscope, like what you see here. And if the objectives are under the specimen stage, then we call that microscope as an inverted microscope. Yeah, that is the only way. A lot of people say that the light comes from top, light comes from the bottom, no such classification. The only way to classify is the, depending on the position of the objectives, whether it is above the stage or under the stage. 
Okay, so what we have a device battle is an axio observer, which is an inverted microscope, a manual inverted microscope, research grade inverted microscope, and we have the model axio observer five. So what I'll do is I'll just go through quickly the components of this so that we can understand the functionality of the microscope. So we have objectives, which is under the stage. We have eyepiece, which is where we peep through. We look through the sample, and then we have a light source, which is called as a transmitted light. I'll come to that in a minute. And then we have a stage with a specimen holder where we can mount a glass slide or a multiple plate, so on and so forth. Um, that is called the specimen stage. You have a camera port, which can be on right side of the microscope or the left side of the microscope or both the sides. We, we can have a microscope with both left and right camera port. Um, that is also possible. We have a light source for fluorescence, which is typically called as reflected light source, RL light source. And then we have a filter turret in a microscope, which goes right under the stage, under the nose piece of the objectives, uh, which is called as a fluorescence filter turret. That is where we mount the filter cubes for the fluorescence, depending on what we want to observe. Of course, we have the fine and coarse focus drive. There's something called as field diaphragm and the condenser. So condenser is here. This is the field diaphragm. Okay, again, um, just to elab very briefly touch upon the functionality of these components, a field diaphragm, uh, controls the area of the sample that has been illuminated. A lot of people I've seen will use the field diaphragm as an intensity regulator. You should not do that. If you are working with a sample which is um, which is photosensitive and you don't want the other regions of the sample to be illuminated at the same time, then please feel free to close down the field diaphragm so that only a particular area of the sample receives light. Okay. Likewise, you also have something called as an aperture diaphragm that controls the numerical aperture of the condenser. So basically in the diagram, what I showed the top cone, that was the, if you calculate the numerical aperture of that particular cone, that will give the numerical aperture of the condenser. When we looked at the bottom, that will give the numerical aperture of the objective. So condenser also has a numerical aperture. What we have in the y particle is a long working distance condenser with a numerical aperture 0 0.55 and a working distance of 26 millimeters. Yeah. So depending on the aperture, what we set, um, it, it also um, regulates the resolution of the image that is going to be produced purely in the transmitted light path. Say, for example, bright field, phase contour, so on and so forth. So when the numerical aperture is 0.95, you can see the light collecting cone is much wider. When it is at 0.65, it's a little narrower, and 0 0.05 is very narrow or absolutely not much. The best possible resolution that we can achieve is when we match the numerical aperture of the objective with the numerical aperture of the condenser. <clears throat> now, what is this condenser? So the condenser, <clears throat> as I mentioned, um, what we have in, DIY part, uh, in, in the microscope there is the LD condenser, which defines the long working distance. We can do bright field, we can do phase contrast, and it is also upgradable to DIC. We don't have DIC at the moment. So what are these? Uh, these are the slots that are inside this particular condenser. Depending on which contrast technique we want to use, we can bring in that particular position into the light path, basically. So when I say I want to use bright field, I set the condenser at bright field position. Basically, an empty position like this will come into the beam path. When I want to do phase contrast, I will use either pH 1, pH 2, or pH 3. That depends on the objective that I want to use for phase contrast. And if I want to use DIC, the components or the optical components necessary for DIC will come into the beam path. Okay. Now, I've been talking a lot about transmitted light and reflected light. So what is transmitted light? Transmitted light is light comes in one direction, passes through the specimen, through the specimen and comes out of the other side of the specimen. Light is being transmitted through, then it becomes a transmitted light. So the, the conventional or most common um, contrast techniques, what transmitted light does is bright field, phase contrast, DIC, and in upright microscopes or certain microscopes, we can also do dark field microscopes. Now, reflected light is when the light comes in one direction, hits the specimen, and the light is collected again back in the opposite direction, then it is called as reflected light. The contrast technique, what we use in reflected light, typically in biology, is fluorescence microscope. So that is what I have mentioned here. Now, <clears throat> how does a lamp source look? So if you see here, what we have there uh, in DY Patel is um, halogen 100, a 100 watt halogen lamp which some, looks something like this. You have a bulb inside and you have reflecting mirrors and collimating mirrors. 
which we align at the time of installation. Um, but typically what you should notice is a halogen lamp will give you a yellow tinge light. Yeah. Nowadays we have LED lamps that will be more whiter and more brighter. Each has its own benefits and weakness. Uh, typically, uh, halogen lamp is useful when you work for high intensity contrast like DIC, then halogen lamp is still more better. But to overcome this yellow tinge, we typically supply with a blue filter where you can put a blue filter on the light path and the observer uh, will not see the yellow color background on the sample, rather it will become more or less whitish in color. Yeah. <clears throat> now, for fluorescence, we have several light sources. Uh, something like um, mercury arc lamp or a metal halide lamp and an LED based lamp. What we have in um, DY Patil is Colibri 7, which is the uh, model name and it is an LED based light source. The other two light sources are also available, but it's not there at the facility at the moment. Um, so I'm not going to discuss much on that. So what are LEDs? LEDs are monochromatic light source. So the LEDs will give individual, you have white light source also, but the version what we have given is four LED version, basically in the white pattern. So you have four individual um, light sources, which will give lights of particular wavelength only. Now advantage is that these are little more um, cooler light than the mercury arc lamp or a metal halide lamp. They are much more um, hot air, uh, hotter basically, which will cause photo damage much more quickly. And uh, LED based light or relatively cool light, it will not cause photo damage as quickly as a mercury or a metal halide lamp will cause. Of course, the lifetime of an LED is much, much, much more higher um, than either of the previous versions. Um, and you can switch on and switch off as and when you want. And the switching between two LEDs is extremely fast. It is uh, 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 about less than 10 milliseconds and ideally suitable for live cell imaging because of uh, lesser phototoxicity. Now, <clears throat> how does the light sources look? So this is an example of a mercury lamp. Uh, this is a metal halide lamp, and this is what we have um, at the facility, which is the Colibri 7. So what is that? So we have individual light sources like a torchlight. I'll show you that in a minute. Much more better stability in terms of there is no fluctuation of the light uh, intensities. Um, it can be switched on and off using a motorized microscope. We can control the switching on and off also. Uh, there is no need of shutter because we can directly switch off the lamp if it is not required. Um, there is no um, warm up time or cool down time for an LED. Of course, the usage is a much more larger time period. I mean, uh, lifetime is larger. And as I mentioned before, produces less heat. Yeah. So, <clears throat> So these um, are like individual um, torchlight kind of thing that goes inside this Colibri uh, light source. So each of them are corresponding to individual wavelengths. So what we have at DY Patil um, has four LEDs, basically 385, 475, 555, and 630. Typically, if you want me to name them as what we can use it for, um, you can use a 385 for imaging DAPI, 475 for GFP, 555 for red, basically Psi 3, uh, TRITC, et cetera. And then 630 for Psi 5, uh, Alexa 630, um, kind of little uh, far red uh, kind of uh, samples, basically. Okay. Now, coming to the contrast techniques, what all you can perform in a microscope, um, typically, is you can do a bright field imaging, we can do phase contrast, we can do DIC. Although at the moment, uh, I'm not sure whether DIC is available in DI part, but I'm not sure it is there. Uh, of course, fluorescence is there, so we can also do fluorescence microscope. Now, <clears throat> so we have looked at um, two components so far. We understood what is magnification. We understood what is resolution. We understood what is numerical aperture, how it contributes to the resolution. We understood the wavelength and all those things. Now we'll come to the um, last part, which is the contrast. Now, what is contrast? Now, a simple example is a teacher writing using a white chalk in a blackboard, right? Now we consider the blackboard to be the background and whatever is written using the white chalk as the foreground, or we understand this is the background and this is the foreground. Similarly, in a microscope, we have to create a background and a foreground, right? Now there are certain times where it is not so easy. Yeah, the nature of the specimen might prohibit us from doing certain things that will create the contrast. Now a simple contrast example is like uh, for fungal samples, we use the Indian ink or lactophenol tripan blue basically, right? So the blue color is going to stain the fungal cell wall and then we are going to see the fungal as a blue color stained sample against a white background. So that is contrast. Now, 
human eye can differentiate um, intensity variation as little as 15 to 20 percent as something lighter and something more darker so that is good thing for us to know so that we can you know create very faint intensity variations and we can utilize that in creating contrast now what you see on the top is a um, picture that was taken using a stereo microscope so we have the natural color of the specimen in this case the green color and the uh, colorful flower bud basically and what you see here is a, a tissue section that is uh, h and e stained basically uh, bright field imaging so the stain um, colors or stains the specimen precisely at particular areas and then unstained area remains white so this will be a bright field now there are certain conditions let's say for example a light cell culture where we are prohibited from adding any stain or any color but we still have to create contrast in that case we can use two kind of contrast techniques one is the phase contrast technique which is for unstained sample and other one is also dic differential interference contrast which can also work with an unstained sample what you see at the bottom is a dic image of a um, as a diatom basically <clears throat> yeah okay. now as i told before what are the contrast technique that use the transmitter light path so please ignore this path here so light comes from the top goes through the sample i mean uh, objective condenser sample objective and everything and it can come through the ips or it can go to the camera um so what we will do is um, for fluorescence is light comes from the fluorescence light source here it passes through a fluorescence filter through the objective hits the sample comes back again in the opposite direction and goes back to the uh, ips or the camera that is why it's called as a reflected light path now <clears throat> so first most common uh, one of the oldest contrast technique what we have is bright field so very simple contrast technique no additional uh, optics and all required a stain on the sample with a white background will give you bright field image um, components required is a halogen light source uh, a condenser a stained sample objective ips as simple as that is a very simple classical beam path nothing more complicated is required for phase contrast we need specific components um phase contrast is created by varying the the phase or the fa shifting the phase of the light um since there's not much time left i'll just um very briefly explain so when light passes through a no sample area it retains its speed when it passes through a slightly thicker region of the sample it drops down its speed and then when it passes through the thickest region of the sample it is the slowest now these different speeds of light will interfere at the back at a, at a particular pos uh, position of the objective where it creates interference and it creates contrast yeah for this to happen what we do is we need to translate this invisible phase shift into a visible difference of intensities now if you see the sample image which is captured in bright field and the same sample created in phase contrast you can tell the difference in the contrast basically likewise this is unstained sample in bright field mode and the unstained sample in phase contrast mode for phase contrast to work you need a phase contrast objective so if you see here this objective says ph2 if you remember my condenser diagram what we have to do is when we have an objective as ph2 we have to position the ph2 in the condenser by rotating a disc into the beam path which means that the components required for phase contrast are aligned in the beam path and then it will create the phase contrast as an I mean, it will create the image based on the phase contrast technique yeah typically for phase contrast we have to use unstained sample thinner sample we cannot use thick sample typically um tissue culture uh, applications and all we can use phase contrast okay so these are the uh, phase annulus that goes inside the condenser you need a phase ring which is already built in, in into the objective that is what is get gets the name ph1 or ph2 or ph3 and then that alignment is what we have to do likewise um, dic will give you similar uh, contrast technique what dic will give is that it will work for unstained thicker sample and it will also give you a pseudo 3d perception like if you look at the same <coughs> excuse me if you look at the same sample what was captured in phase contrast here you can see a little bit of height and depth perception <coughs> yeah okay now what is fluorescence uh, i'll try to cover fluorescence as much as possible so fluorescence is the property of a substance to absorb light of a particular wavelength and emit light of a larger wavelength yeah 
Now, the light that is absorbed by the sample is called as the excitation wavelength. Light that is emitted by the sample is called as the emission wavelength. Excitation wavelength will always be smaller than the emitted wavelength. Simple to understand is blue before green. <clears throat> so if you want to see green color, let's say we are working on FITC, we want to see green color in the eyepiece, we have to illuminate the sample with the blue color light. Yeah. So the so green color is what we want to see. So we have to illuminate the sample with blue color light. Now, excitation wavelength will be smaller than the emission wavelength, which is given by Stokes law or Stokes shift. So easy to remember is blue before green. If you remember blue is before green, blue is the excitation, green is the emission. Now, how does this work inside a microscope? So again, um, so we have a white light source. The light is coming in this direction. We want to illuminate the sample with blue color light. So what we do is we place a filter in the beam path, which is called as an excitation filter, which allows the light between the wavelength 450 to 490. So this is called as a band pass filter. So only blue color light passes through. <clears throat> it hits another component, which is called as a dichroic mirror or a beam splitter, which will reflect anything less than 495. So the incident light is less than 495 nanometers. So it is only 490. So it is reflecting that light. The light passes through the objective, um, illuminates the sample. So in fluorescence microscope, your objective behaves like a condenser also. Yeah, the fluorescent sample has the property of fluorescence. It absorbs the blue color light and it emits light larger than the blue color. Now, as I told you, we want to see only green color. So this time when the light, sorry, this time when the light touches the dichroic mirror, since the wavelength of the emitted wavelength is going to be larger than 490 by Stokes law, anything larger than 495 will be allowed to pass through the dichroic mirror. It passes through the dichroic mirror, but this can include green, yellow, orange, and red, but we want to see only green color. So we place one more filter on the top, which is called as an excitation filter. And this excitation filter allows only the green color to see through. So this is how uh, uh, fluorescence work in a microscope. So all these components, excitation filter, dichroic mirror, and an emission filter are put together in one component, which is called as a filter set. There are specific filter sets available for DAP, GFP, RFP, so on and so forth, CFP, YFP. So one filter set comprises an excitation filter, dichroic mirror, and an emission filter. Now, lastly, uh, before I finish, I just touched about the camera, what we have. So we have a monochrome camera installed in, uh, in the facility, which is a black and white camera. So what is a camera? Um, a camera is a device that lets us capture um, the event, either a video or a photography. And in this case, a digital camera can represent the intensities um, through values as decimals or uh, in a binary value, zeros and ones. Then it becomes a digital camera. So I'll just skip through this. What we have, um, in DY Patel is a monochrome camera, which is recommended for fluorescence microscope. So why we have to give a black and white camera uh, for capturing fluorescence microscope is because a, uh, a black and white camera will not have something called as a Bayer's mask in front of the camera. Now, there are filters that are present in a color camera, typically blue filter, green filter and red filter. Light, which is closer to the blue filter will pass through the blue ridge, blue color will pass through the blue filter. Light closer to the green color will pass through the green filter. Light closer to the red uh, color will pass through the red filter. And the final image is extrapolated from the, uh, these colors to give the original color, basically. Now, fluorescence imaging is low level, uh, low signal imaging, basically, because even though fluorescence image looks very bright uh, against a dark background, the signals from a fluorescent sample is extremely sparse and low. So a monochrome camera will not have this Bayes filter. So light does not pass through any filter. <clears throat> Whatever little photons we had will directly reach the detector. And so a monochrome camera is much more sensitive than a color camera so that we collect any low level of signal so uh, easily than a color camera. That is why uh, monochrome cameras are preferred against color cameras for fluorescence application. Apart from this, apart from this, <clears throat> so here is what you see as the uh, Bayer's mask. So you have blue filter, green filter, and a red filter. And then in a monochrome camera, this filter is absent so that the signal directly reaches the sensor. Yeah. Now, apart from this, a monochrome camera also has better 
resolution. <clears throat> Why? Because since there is no extrapolation or interpolation of the signal that is arriving at the sensor, the resolution, the spatial resolution is much more defined than a color camera. So it is always recommended to have monochrome camera for better sensitivity and better resolution, better spatial, uh, spatial resolution for fluorescence imaging. Now, a simple example is um, same uh, object captured through a color camera is on the left and captured through the um, monochrome camera is on the right. If I just zoom in at the number 32, for example, here, you don't see the number of lines actually, but when we see um, in a monochrome camera, we can clearly differentiate the lines. Um, so that's an example of you know um, a monochrome camera being more um, sensitive and much more better resolving than a color camera. Lastly, what we have in um, the software is Zen software. Basically, we have Zen light. This software, can control the camera for your imaging. Um, it can do uh, objective magnifications. We can do um, scaling of your images automatically. We can do separation of images. We can capture multi-channel images all manually because the microscope, what you have is a manual microscope. So you can capture um, green color, red color, blue color and merge them together as single image. We can do basic geometrical measurements like uh, length, uh, size, um, so on and so forth. We can have annotations, scale bar. So all of that uh, comes as a default in the, uh, in the basic version of the software, which is also provided. We can also do a, a very small uh, video recording or a movie recording in the uh, Zen light that is available there. So that can be used to capture very small videos of a moving sample, like say, for example, any cells that are moving kind of thing that can also be performed in the um, software that is provided there. Okay, so considering time, I think I'll stop here. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Ramanath. It was a really wonderful talk. You have explained the basics of microscopy so well. So now I would request students to write down their questions. I think uh, Dr. Uh, Amruta will be taking the questions from them. Yes, sure. So I request the participants to please Type their questions in the question and answer box. Meanwhile, uh, Dr. Amarnath, yes, uh, th thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Uh, I have a small question for you. Yes, uh, since we are focusing on the fluorescent microscopy, could you please elaborate on the fluorescent dyes? I mean, how to choose uh, uh, different dyes if we are performing the staining with multiple uh, fluorescent dyes? Okay, uh, well, fluorescence can be brought about by um, different uh, methods. One is fluorescent dye, which can be specific or non-specific. The other is um, protein, which is like GFP, RFP, which is in, uh, indigenously expressed by the living metabolically active uh, cell, for example, or the other one will be the fluorescent probes. <laughs> Now, fluorescent probes are extremely um, specific, complementary uh, strands of DNA that binds specific to one particular region. A fluorescent dye may not necessarily be specific. It can be non-specific also. Now, when we choose fluorescent uh, dyes or proteins, whatever, one thing we have to keep in mind is their excitation and emission peak maximum. Yeah. Now, say, for example, if I say CFP and YFP, CFP peaks at 500 and, uh, sorry, um, CFP and GFP, CFP uh -huh. peaks at 500 nanometer and GFP peaks at 525. There is always a possibility that the emission of the first fluorescence can always spill over into the emission of the second fluorescence. So when we look at uh, designing an experiment, we should consider the emission spectra of dye 1 and dye 2 and dye 3 and we should choose them such a way that they don't overlap with each other. In that case, yeah. if you do that, then we will avoid something called as an emission crosstalk or bleed through. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Thank you so much for answering my query. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have one question in the QA box. What kind of camera is present in SEM and or TEM? Uh, I'm not an electron microscopy um, specialist by any means. Uh, but one thing I can say you, there are detectors which are specific for particular um, signal that are uh, collected. So one is called the secondary electron, one is, other is called the backscatter electrons kind of thing. But I don't think these are cameras, these are probes basically. Uh, I'm not sure what kind of a camera exactly goes inside an electron microscope. Okay, that's fine. 
Uh, I think, uh, yeah, we have another question. How is axial uh, resolution achieved? Okay, very good. Um, okay, so axial resolution is achieved in a particular type of machine, what we call as an optical sectioning device, which is called uh, a confocal microscope, for example. A confocal microscope typically has a specific component, which is called as a pinhole that is located in front of a detector. Now, the pinhole is like a small iris, which can close and open like a camera shutter. Depending on how much we close or open the pinhole, the amount of light that passes through the pinhole is defined. If the pinhole is larger, open to a larger size, then light from a thicker region will pass through. If the pinhole is closed, light only from a thinner region will pass through and reach the detector. The smaller the pinhole, better is the Z resolution. Now, when I say light from a thicker or a small, thinner region, I mean the 3D in the third dimension, whether a thick uh, region goes in or a thin region. Typically, a pinhole uh, size in a confocal is predetermined. It is typically set at something called as one area unit, depending on the wavelength of the light you use and also the objective's numerical aperture. And I don't think uh, we have enough time to explain the whole uh, principle of confocal, but that is a nutshell I can give you. Yeah, I think that's enough. And I think uh, you have answered the question. Uh, okay. Yeah, very well. So now, thank you so much. Uh, if there are no any further questions, I would like to thank Dr. Amarnath for such a wonderful presentation and we'll move uh, forward to the next session. Thank uh, you, Dr. Which is, yeah. Before we move forward, we would like to felicitate Dr. Amarnath for such a wonderful uh, talk. And we really appreciate his contribution to the workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you Madam. so Thank much, you. sir. Thank you so much. So now we'll move on to the next session, which uh, will be conducted by Dr. Tanushri, and she will be demonstrating the uh, application of fluorescent microscope uh, in the current uh, workshop. Yeah, over Thank to you, Dr. Amrita. So Dr. Amarnath has made my task so easy. He has explained so well the basics of microscopy, which is essential actually to understand the demonstration. In the demonstration, we will actually show the microscope, its different parts, which have already, the basics of which have already been explained by Dr. Amarna. So in this uh, demonstration, we will learn how to operate this Axio Observer 5 size inverted microscope. So I would now share the video for demonstration of the microscope. And this video has been made by myself and my student Mr. Prakash Gajanan Kulkarni. Now I'll start the video. This is Zeiss inverted light microscope of the Axio Observer series with bright field, phase contrast and fluorescence modules. These are the binocular eyepieces with adjustable interocular distance. The microscope is controlled by ZenBlue software. The body buttons are at the back and at the side. This is the remote for selecting the bandpass excitation filters. Upon switching on, the LCD display on transmitted light carrier gets on. This is the external shutter for transmitted light. The adjustable screws are for cohelar alignment. These are the objectives. It has five different objectives from 5x to 63x oil immersion. This is the reflector turret. It needs to be set at position 1 for transmitted light and 2 for reflected light. This knob controls the intensity of the transmitted light. While taking bright field, please ensure that transmitted light is on. For fluorescence, RL is to be on. This knob is for controlling the light path. At this position, 80% of the signal is going to the camera and rest 20% to the eyepiece. In this position, the light 
signal is going completely to the eyepiece. Please ensure that this knob is kept at the eye symbol. This is the light source with four LEDs RGB and UV. This is the monochrome camera AxioCam 503. This is the condenser for transmitted light. H is for bright field, pH1, pH2 and pH3 are for the phase contrast. This is the software that is Zen Blue. Now we are going to observe a fixed tissue sample and use immunofluorescence for checking the expression of the protein. Place the sample gently on the scanning stage, tissue facing the objective lens. For bright field, ensure that TL is switched on and turret position is at 1. Focus the sample with coarse and fine focus and scan the sample at lower magnification like 5x or 10x by the help of coaxial driver that Once the region of interest is located, we need to increase the magnification. So we have now increased the magnification to 40x. Our sample has fluorescent signal from DAPI that is staining the nuclei and Alexa 488. So for fluorescence, we will be putting the reflector turret at 2 and RN should be on. Now we have selected the UV filter from the remote and put the blue channel here. So this signal which we are getting is of the DAPI. So first we will click the live image, adjust the intensity and then take a snap. Same thing we will do even for Alexa 488 where we will select the blue filter and the channel will be at green. First we will take the live image and adjust the intensity. and then take a snap. Once all the three snaps are taken, then we need to go to the processing tab. Here we will merge all these three images. First we will take the bright field, then the DAPI, will merge these two images. Then we'll take the first merge image and then put the third signal that is green and we'll say merge again. So we will get the signal for all three channels. We will adjust the intensity once again for, for clarity. These changes are allowed as all these informations are saved in the image itself. Now we will talk about microscopy on cells. For that we will discuss a little bit on cell culture techniques. We are going to prepare liquid media from this powder media. We have sodium bicarbonate, we have distilled water, autoclaved and now we will put the powdered media in the autoclave distilled water, mix it well.
this media has phenol red indicator. Now we are adding sodium bicarbonate as per the recommended condition. This is the filtration assembly which we will be using to filter this media. This is the silicon base on which we will be keeping the nylon filter of 0.22 micron pore size. We need to place the filter very carefully so that there is no leakage of the medium. This nozzle we will be using to fit in the vacuum pump. The pH of the medium has been adjusted to 7.2 after adjusting the volume to 1 liter. Since it is phenol red pH indicator, it is showing the brick red color. The vacuum pump is generating a negative pressure of 27 mmHg which is leading to the filtration of the medium. And now we are pouring out the medium into an autoclave bottle by equalizing the air pressure on both the sides. We have the incomplete DMEM F12 media ready with us. On this we will need to add fetal bovine serum of 5 to 10 percent to make it a complete medium. This is human neuroblastoma cell line SHSY 5Y. As you can see, the color of the DMEM F12 media which we just made has now turned yellow, which shows that it has become acidic. We will discard the spent medium. This is the serological pipette. Which we will now fit into the electronic pipetter. to take out the entire spent media. We will now give it a quick wash with DPBS. PBS which will not have the divalent cations like calcium and magnesium. Just take 1 ml of DPBS, put it into the flask and give the flask a quick swirl. Take out the DPBS and discard it. Now we will add trypsin EDTA for dislodging the cells from the flask as SHSY5Y is an adherent cell line for passaging it we would need to dislodge it from the substrate. Add enough trypsin EDTA so that it covers the entire surface of the flask. We are putting it in the CO2 incubator for three to four minutes. Now the cells have come out, most of them have dislodged. Gentle tapping will help in enhancing the dislodging. Once the dislodging is done, then trypsin is 
diluted immediately with PBS, 10 times dilution of trypsin will inactivate the trypsin and will prevent the cells from getting harmed. We will now centrifuge these cells at 1200 rpm for 5 minutes in swinging bucket rotor. After that we will get the cell pellet at the bottom, discard the supernatant We will once again repeat the centrifugation step for washing which is not being shown over here. Finally we will resuspend the pellet in 1 ml of DPBS. Take 20 microliter of this cell suspension into 1.5 ml MCT and add 20 microliter of 4% trypan blue solution. Mix it with the cell suspension. This is the hemocytometer on which we are going to load the tripan blue stained cells for cell counting. After counting we found that it has 3 into 10 to the power 6 cells. For microscopy we will sterilize the cover slips in 70% ethanol and air dry it. Take a sterile 6 well plate, heat the cover slip lightly in flame and place on the 6 well plate. Now we will coat the cover slip with poly and lysine and leave it overnight at 4 degree centigrade. Next day we will remove the poly and lysine, give it a quick wash and we will load the cells which we have got in the previous section. At appropriate cell density, we will remove the media and give the cells wash with PBS, then followed by permeabilization step with detergents like Tween 20. Permeabilization step will be followed by blocking and then staining with primary and secondary antibodies. Subsequent to each step, there will be stages of 2 to 3 washing. Once the staining with secondary antibody is done, the cover slip will now be mounted on the slide. On the slide, we will put the mounting agent. This is Fluoroshield with DAPI from Sigma. Since it is stained with secondary antibody having fluorophore, we generally keep it well covered in the dark. The cover slip needs to be gently picked up with the help of needle and forceps. Excess PBS will have to be soaked. And now we can put the cover slip on the slide, taking care that there are no bubbles. We will then seal the cover slip with the help of nail polish.
Once it has dried, we are now observing it under the microscope at lower magnification that is 10x. First, we will have to do the focusing at ma lower magnification and then we need to check for the signal of DAPI as we have explained earlier. Then we are checking for the signal of Alexa 488. Here we have stained beta actin with antibodies labeled with Alexa 488. Since we have now focused under lower magnification for seeing the actual localization of beta actin, we will have to move on to 63x oil immersion microscope objectives. So we have used the immersion oil and have carefully placed the slide on the scanning stage. Now we will slowly in increase the intensity of the transmitted light, take the live image, adjust the minor focusing, set exposure and then the take the snap. Once we have taken the snap of the phase contrast image, then we will switch on to the RL mode. UV filter will be selected and here the blue channel we will select to get the signal of DAPI. We will adjust the intensity as discussed earlier. Take the snap. We will again select the blue filter from the remote and here we will select the green channel for getting the signal of Alexa 488 coming from beta actin. Once we have taken all the three images, we will go to the processing tab and do the overlay that is merging. We will first take the bright field image, then the image of DAPI and we will say merge and as soon as we click on apply, we will get the merged image. This merged image we will again put as input and green as the second input. Then again we will say apply and now we will get the signal from all three channels. We will need to adjust the intensity for clarity. Now we can see all the information about this image will be saved and can be retrieved from these panels like the 2.5D image, the gallery image, histogram, all the measurements and additional information. We can do the post processing by going to the graphics tab and add scale bar we can also put arrows if we require at certain stage we can even add text since these are neuronal cells we have labeled the cells as neurons and the extensions as neurites, we can see that one of the neuron is getting connected to the other through the neurites. So 
save all your images in proper folder in the beginning you can create a project and that will be the folder where it will get saved please remember to save both as czi as well as in tiff or jpeg whichever is preferable for you but czi is a must we will do another set of similar imaging in a different region so that the processes or in the steps are more clear So right now we are taking the face contrast image adjusting its intensity Next we will go for selecting the UV excitation filter and then we will select the blue channel here this signal is of dappy which gets excited in the uv range and emits at the blue range next we have selected the blue excitation filter from the remote and in this we have selected the green channel because alexa 488 gets excited at blue region and emits in the green region all these three different images we will now overlay by going to the processing tab we will first put the face contrast and then the dappy image and then we'll get the output in terms of overlay this first overlay will again be used as input and green as input to and we'll do the merging again then by saying apply so now we will get the signal from all three channels we are adjusting the intensity as per our requirement for clarity and from this panel we can get all the information like the gallery 2.5d image profile of the image which will give the necessary information like channels intensities and all we will get from the histogram when we save the image in czi mode all these informations are saved axio observer series is best for fixed cell and thin tissue section imaging it allows for lot of post processing utilities like adding graphics and all
one of the major applications of immunofluorescence microscopy or fluorescence microscopy is to check for the expression of proteins and also to check for their localization Now we are going to do live cell imaging. HEK293 T cells have been transfected with the clone of CD151, which is a surface protein. It has been cloned with RFP fluorophore. So we will first focus the cells at 10x. And now we will shift to RL with the excitation filter of green and channel of emission set at red. We can see that the fluorescence is being shown mostly in the membrane although for localizing the exact point of expression we will need to go to higher magnification. Now we are coming to the end of this demonstration where we need to learn how to switch off this machine. First, we will exit the software. Then, we will switch off the remote, switch off the body button, side button first, and then the back button, and then we'll cover the microscope. Thank you so much for watching. Right now we just saw how to use Axio Observer 5 microscope both for fixed cell and live cell imaging. Now we will have another uh, talk on the study design that is how to uh, go about staining the cells, how to put your fluorescence microscope slides ready. So please allow me to share one more video with you in which we will demonstrate how to go about putting up the fluorescence microscopy experiment. Hello everyone, in this session we are going to talk about the applications of optical microscopy, especially focusing on fluorescence microscopy, its application and study design. We will refer to Zeiss inverted light microscope of Axio Observer 5 series. This instrument has been procured with the help of DST FIST Phase 1 grant to Dr. D.Y. Patil, Biotechnology and Bioinformatics Institute, Pune. Axio Observer 5 optical microscope has different modules like bright field, phase contrast, fluorescence. Differential interference contrast is currently not present, but it can be upgraded to the DIC module. Axio Observer series supports bright field, phase contrast, DIC and fluorescence microscopy. It has various applications Two of the applications we have seen in the detail in the last section, that is fixed cell imaging and thin tissue section imaging.
apart from these axio observer series is specially designed for examination of blood and tissue sample of the body observation of intracellular processes in living cell culture cell cell interactions motility growth it can even be used to study drug detection and toxicity studies single molecule detection can also be done with the help of axio observer series now we will move on to transmitted light microscopy the term transmitted light when used in optical microscopy refers to any imaging modality where light is passed from the illumination light source on the opposite side of the specimen to the objective hence the transmitted light is crossing through the specimen in transmitted light microscopy investigations dealing with inherently low contrast specimens such as unstained tissue slices bacteria adherent cell lines live cells rely specialized on contrast enhancing techniques to assist with imaging of these virtually transparent samples in the course of examining unstained specimens poor light absorption by the specimen results in extremely small variations in the intensity distribution between the specimen and the background hence for bright field we generally require stained samples in bright field contrast imaging depends on light absorption refractive index of the specimen or the color that is stain present on the specimen these optical disparities or contrast are developed as light passes through the specimen and its direction is getting altered by the specimen not only direction even the speed or spectral characteristics of the imaging wave front also gets altered the technique of bright field imaging is more useful when we use stained specimens stains which are visible by the help of absorbing dyes like here we have a tissue section stained with eosin and hematoxylin stains for unstained samples we depend upon contrast enhancing techniques of optical microscopy two such techniques are phase contrast microscopy and differential interference contrast microscopy first we will discuss about phase contrast microscopy phase contrast microscopy employs an optical mechanism to translate minute variations in phase into corresponding changes in amplitude which can be visualized as differences in image contrast the microscope must be equipped with a specialized condenser containing an annulus or a series of annuli these annuli are matched according to the set of objectives which contain phase rings 
In our last section of the microscope demonstration, we showed that the condenser has pH 1, pH 2, pH 3 phase rings. Phase contrast is an excellent method to increase contrast when viewing or imaging live cells. Very small differences exist between the refractive indices of cells and their surrounding solutions. Even within the cell, between cytosol and cell organelles, there is difference in refractive indices. Phase contrast makes these tiny differences visible by the use of optical manipulation. In phase contrast configuration, the condenser aperture diaphragm is replaced by a phase stop. The phase stop size depends upon the objective and condenser numerical aperture. Phase stop illuminates the specimen via condenser, putting a hollow cone of light. The phase ring or the plate attenuates the bright direct light originating from the phase top and also adds a constant phase shift to this light. Therefore, if the specimen contains substructures that have mixed refractive indices, these entities will guide the light from direct waves into new paths. Wavefronts diffracted by the specimen therefore will not pass through the phase ring, meaning that they will not be attenuated or retarded. All of the wavefronts finally are recombined to form an intermediate image. The image of a specimen in phase contrast can be influenced by appropriately selecting the retardation of non-diffracted beam through careful selection of the phase ring in the objective. Depending on the retardation value selected, objects with higher refractive index than their surroundings appear either brighter or darker than their surroundings. This is called as either positive or negative phase contrast. Now we will come to another technique which is used for enhancing the contrast that is differential interference contrast or DIC image. In Differential interference contrast microscopy, we require plain polarized light. Therefore, in front of the light source, a polarizer is kept. This plain polarized light enters the Nomarsky prism or light shearing prism, which shears this light orthogonally, which exaggerates the minute differences in the specimen and it is made to have greater contrast. Lipid bilayers, for example, produce excellent contrast in DIC. And because of this difference in refractive index between aqueous phase and the lipid phase, we can see the cells so clearly. So these are the phase contrast images and we can see these are the DIC images of the same specimen. And the clarity of the DIC image is more than the phase contrast image. In addition to increased contrast, DIC exhibits decreased depth of field at wide apertures, creating thin sections of the thick specimen. This effect is very advantageous when we are trying to image adherent cells to minimize blurring that arises from floating debris in the 
cell culture medium. Now we will move on to fluorescence microscopy in live cells and immunofluorescence microscopy study design in the fixed cells. In our last section, we saw that for live cells, we need to clone the cell, clone the gene in the cell with a fluorophore. So for our example, we have cloned it with red fluorescent protein. So wherever our protein gets expressed, we will get the signal from the fluorophore. Now we are going to do live cell imaging. HEK293 E cells have been transfected with the clone of CD151, which is a surface protein. It has been cloned with RFP fluorophore. So we will first focus the cells at 10x. And now we will shift to RL with the excitation filter of green and channel of emission set at red. We can see that the fluorescence is being shown mostly in the membrane. For immunofluorescence on fixed cells, we have to follow certain steps. Once the seeded cells reach the amount of proper confluence, we need to remove the media and fix those cells on the cover slips. After fixation comes the step of permeabilization. This step is essential for the antibodies to go inside the cell. Therefore, if we are doing some intracellular protein localization or expression, we will need to do this step. This step is followed by blocking, where we are trying to block the non-specific binding of the primary antibodies. Primary antibody is the one that is specific to the protein of our interest. Primary antibody itself could be tagged with the fluorophore. Then we need not go to the secondary antibody. Or else, we can do the staining with secondary antibody which is conjugated with the fluorophore. Now we are going to talk about all these steps in a little bit more detail. We will start with preparation of the cover slips. We know that the cover slips will have to be sterilized and then have to be coated with something which will enhance the adhesion of the cells to the substratum. In this case, we have used poly L lysine. Poly D lysine is also used. There are other cell addition enhancement reagents which are also often used. Poly L lysine could be left on the cover slip for an hour at room temperature. Or in our case, we have left it overnight at 4 degree centigrade. Next day, we will have to remove the polyallycine and give a thorough wash with the water. For microscopy, we will sterilize the cover slips in 70% ethanol and air dry it. Take a sterile six well plate. Heat the cover slip lightly in flame and place on the six well plate. Now we will coat the cover slip with poly and lysine and leave it overnight at 4 degree centigrade. Once we have prepared our cover slip, then we are re ready for cell seeding. For each well format, there is an appropriate seeding density. For six well format, the seeding density is around 10 to the power 5 cells. In our case, 
we have seeded 5 into 10 to the power 5 cells. Each well of 6 well plate should not have more than 2 ml of cell culture. For cell seeding, we should always take the count of number of viable cells. So in this cell suspension, we will add 4% of tripan blue, which is retained only by the dead cells. The live cells will exclude out the tripan blue. Hence, after tripan blue staining, we will be able to calculate the number of viable cells. We found that we have 3 into 10 to the power 6 viable cells, which had to be seeded equally in 6 wells. Hence, we resuspended the cells in 600 microliter of complete media and each 100 microliter had 5 into 10 to the power 5 cells. Next, once the cells have reached their required confluence, we will need to remove the cell culture media and will have to fix the cells on the cover slip. For fixation, we can either use alcohol-based fixatives or aldehyde-based fixatives. Methanol is one of the commonly used alcohol-based fixatives where we can fix the cells in chilled 100% methanol at room temperature for 5 minutes. For aldehyde-based fixatives, we can use 4% paraformaldehyde in PBS with pH 7.4 for 10 minutes at room temperature. Some even use glutaraldehyde for fixatives. Next comes the step of permeabilization, which is essential when we are trying to do intracellular protein localization or intracellular staining. For permeabilization, we use detergents like Triton X100 or Tween20. In our case, we have used 0.1% tween 20. We will have to be very careful with the timing of permeabilization. It should not exceed beyond 10 to 15 minutes, otherwise, it will cause excessive damage to the cell membrane. Followed by permeabilization, we need to wash these cells thoroughly with PBS. After permeabilization, we should do the step of blocking to restrict non-specific binding of the antibodies with the proteins. We use generally bovine serum albumin for the blocking. The blocking buffer often contains glycine. The role of glycine is to block the unreacted aldehydes after fixation which can give actually background fluorescence. Therefore, from 0.05 to 0.2 molar glycine is often used in the blocking buffer that is in PBST, that is PBS in 1.1% twin twenty. After the blocking buffer is kept at room temperature, for one hour or it can even be kept overnight at 4 degree centigrade. We need to remove this blocking antibody which can even be reused and then wash the cells three times in PBS. After the primary antibody incubation step, we need to do the 
incubation with secondary antibody. Secondary antibody also we generally make in 1% DSA. And for secondary antibody, staining for one hour at room temperature in the dark is generally enough. Secondary antibodies are tagged with chlorophore, therefore we do the staining at dark. After one hour, we can remove the antibody and give thorough wash. If we are trying to stain more than one protein, we can go for either simultaneous staining or sequential staining. For simultaneous staining, we incubate the cells in both primary antibodies kept together in a humified chamber either at room temperature for one hour or overnight at four degree centigrade. In this case, we will have to remember that both the primary antibodies should have been raised in two different hosts. Like one should be mouse antibody, the other one may be rabbit antibody. Both should not be from mouse or should not be from rabbit. Once the staining is done, we need to do the washing and we can now add two different secondary antibodies tagged with two different chlorophores. We will have to remember that we are adding the secondary antibodies against two different isotypes. That is, one is anti-mouse, the other one is anti-rabbit. And for secondary antibody, the staining could again be completed in one hour at room temperature. If we are doing sequential staining, then we will have to follow the usual staining procedure, first with one primary antibody kept in the humified chamber overnight or for one hour at room temperature. Remove the first antibody, give a washing and then give the first secondary antibody. Then we will need to follow the entire step for the second primary antibody. Once the staining is done with the primary and secondary antibody, we do counter staining of the nuclei. Hex or DAPI is used as DNA stain. DAPI can be even be present on the mounting media like in our case. And within a minute, we can stain the nuclei. Once the staining with, of DNA is done, then we will have to mount the cover slips on the slide. Cover slip will now be mounted on the slide. On the slide, we will put the mounting agent. This is Fluoroshield with DAPI from Sigma. Since it is stained with secondary antibody having chlorophore, we generally keep it well covered in the dark. The cover slip needs to be gently picked up with the help of needle and forceps. Excess PBS will have to be soaked. And now we can put the cover slip on the slide taking care that there are no bubbles. We will then seal the cover slip with the help of So these are the steps of staining the slides or cover slips for fixed cell immunofluorescence imaging. We have seen the imaging with the help of Active Observer 5 microscope in detail. Only thing we should always remember that the focusing 
has to be done in lower magnification. Once the region of interest is found, the focusing has been majorly done, then only we need to move on to the higher magnification. At higher magnification, fine focusing can be done and it will be followed by checking the signal for our fluorescence. So initially we do the bright field or phase contrast imaging and then we move on to the fluorescence imaging. Thank you all for watching. Thank you so much for attending. Now we can take up questions. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Tanushri, for explaining the actual uh, functioning of the microscope and handling of the microscope in your initial uh, slides. And then it was also uh, useful uh, to know the staining procedures for um, visualizing the protein of interest by staining it with different uh, fluorochromes. So I would request all the participants to please type their questions in the Q&A box. In the meantime, I would also like to notify the students that uh, founder of Biotalk magazine is here with us to explain what competition they are going to hold for the students for writing the article for their magazine regarding this workshop. So I think there is one uh, question. Yes, uh, there is one question. Why is only nylon used in initial filtering of phenol red media? Not only nylon, earlier people used to use nitrocellulose as well. There are different types of filters and uh, there, uh, PVDF filters are also used. But nylon is more sturdy and it hence the pore size can be controlled very easily. Moreover, the hydrophobicity is also less and that's, that's why hydrophobicity also can be controlled. So filtering aqueous media uh, becomes easier. Actually, PES is also used very frequently for filtering the media. Yes. I can't see any uh, other question. So shall we move ahead? So if there are no more questions, I think we can invite uh, founder of Biotalk magazine to give the talk and explain to our students what they hold for us. Thank you, Dr. Amruta, for conducting the QA session. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, ma'am. This is Dipakshi, the founder of the Biotalk magazine. Hi. Hi. Uh, can I share my screen now? Yes, please. Can you see the screen? Hello? Yes, you are audible. Please uh, switch on your camera if possible. Sure, ma'am. But are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can see the PowerPoint. Please put okay. it in slideshow mode. If... Yes, yes. All right, so everyone can see my screen and hear me? Yes. Okay. So, hi, thank you, ma'am, for having me here. Um, it's such a great opportunity to talk to your students and the faculty. And uh, congratulations on holding such an amazing workshop. Um, so, I'm Dipakshi Kasad, the founder of the Biotalk magazine. Um, our basic aim is to make biotechnology accessible to everyone. Um, so, what we have today in store for you is... Um, now talking about who we are here, um, the Biotalk magazine was launched in June 2020 and we release issues every month. So that way we've completed 10 issues so far. Um, the topic areas that we cover um, includes anything under the umbrella of life sciences. Um, so basically from pharma, genetics, cancer biology to even botany, zoology, we've received numerous articles on a very diverse field. Um, 
So the mission here, as I explained, is to make biotechnology accessible to everyone, but also to build a biotech community um, where students, researchers, scholars, professors, everyone is on one platform so that um, you know they can all together work on something great. Um, also, uh, we, uh, we, want, we want to make our articles uh, accessible to everyone. So the language, the content, the accuracy is such that um, it is kind of different from the journal articles from as, as from a research paper, but also um, it is something that even a student from the first year can understand. Um, ne next, we have a global reach. When I say global reach, um, we've, we have scientists from US, UK, Australia, Canada who have recognized our mission and joined hands. They send us articles. We've conducted their interviews and they're ready to help students if they have um, pro project ideas. They're ready to fund your ideas if you get in touch with them. So. The Biotalk magazine is also acting as a bridge to make something lucrative. Um, now, in talking about the sections in our magazine, we have um, we, obviously we have an editorial section where um, our core team writes uh, presents articles of their findings or anything that's going on recently. Uh, we conduct an interview of a successful biotechnologist every month. So that that comes under the You Inspire section. They discuss their journey, any opportunities they have for you. So you can learn from that. We have a what's new section where um, students uh, can send in their articles about any recent research, development, technology that has come up, and um, we feature it there. We have an opinion section. We believe that uh, biotechnology and life sciences is, in general, a kind of a controversial field. Um, so apart from the facts, uh, students and scientists can have strong opinions about certain things. So um, that is covered under that. We also have a new separate section called From the Expert, where um, articles from the faculty, from uh, scientists, uh, are exclusively portrayed there. So they are much more advanced and accurate uh, since they're directly coming from the expert. So these are the sections that we cover. I'll be talking a little bit more about the magazine, and then I'll come to the competition that we have in hand for you. Um, so this is our progress report. We've, uh, we've released eight, 10 issues so far. We have a writing community of around 80 plus writers. We've featured around 110 plus articles, and we have a reader base of, we can say proudly that 6,000 plus article uh, of readers. So um, when you send us an article, a lot of people are reading it, and not just in India, but across the world. Now, if you want to write an article for us, uh, there are three ways you can send it. Um, there is the first way is you submit us the entire article. So if you have a topic in mind and you're confident about your writing style, you can directly go to our website and click on the submit button article, submit article button, which will take you to a form and then you upload all your all your con article content there and then submit it to us. Secondly, if you are not sure about the topic and um, if you, for example, do not have such great writing experience, you can send us a 100 word abstract and um, we will review your abstract, give you certain uh, help about um, what references to refer to um, the structure of article you can follow. So again, we have a submit abstract button on the website, which you can use. Um, lastly, if you do not know what to write on, we have another option for that as well. You can simply send us three to five interest areas um, that you have and um, what your background is, for example, if you're a bachelor student, which year you are in, or a master's student, or, and a certain relevant projects that you've covered. So these things can help us, help you finalize the topic. So you can simply mail us for the last option um, on connect at the rate thebiotalkmagazine.com, or you can connect with one of the ambassadors that we have in your institute. So these are the three methods you can send us an article in. Now the process of article review, when you submit, an, submit a research paper to a journal, to a reputed journal, it usually goes through a peer review process. So we have tried to simulate that for our magazine. Now every article you send goes through three steps. First is the first read by the editor, um, where they check for relevance, plagiarism, format, structure. Once your article bypasses this, um, it goes through our senior uh, advisor's technical check, where the senior advisor checks for the for accuracy, for the content that you have, for the kind of research that you're portraying. Once you bypass that step, we subject your article through our software, in-house software, where we check for grammar, structure, style. And um, finally, if we think your article is feature-ready, it will be featured in our uh, upcoming issue. Now, throughout this process, um, 
there can be multiple revision rounds required because not every article that reaches us in, is in its feature ready form. So we will keep sending you the article till the time with our revision and comments till the time we think um, it needs more work to be done. Um, so um, till if you are very uh, stubborn about publishing the article in our magazine, we will help you throughout the process. Um, now coming to what are the student benefits that you, as a student you get. Now, firstly, at an undergrad level, not many of us uh, have get the opportunity to publish a research paper in a journal or a review paper because um, we do not have that kind of expertise and um, facilities available. So you get an article writing experience through our magazine for a small 500 to 700 word article. So as I said, it goes through a peer review process. You understand for what formatting is, what writing is, what researching it. So all that goes into this. You get research and learning experience beyond your textbook, um, beyond your coursework. So when you write an article, you expend a lot of energy and effort to find out uh, what goes into that particular area, what is happening in that research, in that section. So that kind of research and learning comes along with it. We provide feedback at every step. And um, from that too, from our editor, from our advisor, from our senior advisor, everyone is there to help you. Um, for to add to your resume, you get a letter of appreciation. Um, right now, we have uh, been recognized in various forms. And hopefully, in the next three, four months, Biotalk Magazine will become a bigger name and um, it will mean much more on your resume. So, definitely, that letter of appreciation that you get is uh, very valuable. And you get a networking opportunity. So, when you put an article, a lot of people are reading it. Um, a lot of scientists, a lot of professors are reading it. And if they recognize your talent, you never know what opportunity can knock your door. Now, coming to the faculty benefit, as I said, we have a separate section, uh, which is from the experts for our faculty. Um, so when you can get to reach out to students beyond your institute to your article, so because spreading your knowledge and learning is always something every faculty looks forward to. Um, now, in the form of 500 to 600 art word article, you can simplify your research papers that you've featured in other journals for better understanding and better outreach. Uh, so that is something you can definitely do. Um, you can also share your journey with us through our You Inspire Us interview section. So if anyone is interested, you can just drop us an email or connect with our ambassadors and then they can help you connect with us further. Now, reader benefits. If you do not want to write an article, send an article, you can always read our magazine because um, we promise to give you updated, accurate content. Um, we cover recent developments, opinions, interviews uh, for students to read interviews of success, successful biotechnologists. Not only do you understand what career path to choose, but also what, uh, what kind of potential does that particular field have. So um, you some definitely taking back something if you access our website. And uh, all the content available is free, of course. Neither do the writers, nor do the readers have to pay anything. Now, coming to the collaboration. Now, um, ma'am, thank you again for um, uh, inviting, uh, inviting me here. It is our honor to collaborate with GCEC 2021. Now, we in the, what this competition that we're organizing is about is we want to invite students to make a submission in the form of an article. Now, um, whatever you're learning from this workshop, you can pick out any one important aspect, basically any one major concept that's been covered in this workshop, you can pick out and research further on its technology, applicability, current use, future use, and pen an article of around 500 to 700 words on the above concept. Once you've penned that down, you can follow our author guidelines for format and structure available on our website. There is also an article template document that you can download and um, basically submit your article through our submit article button and fill the form, upload your file. And you can send us the article by 14th of April, 2021. So if we think the article is close to feature ready, it can also get featured in our April issue, which will be released on 20th April. Um, if we think it requires more work, we can push it to the May issue that will be coming out on 20th May. Now, um, one important thing that you need to remember is so just add GCEC 2021 submission in the comment section of the submission form so that we can recognize that, okay, you're submitting for this competition. Now, um, we will be uh, reviewing your article and selecting articles um, in the normal, in the general format. That is the review process will be the same as for other articles, but the top articles will be featured under um, 
the heading of GCEC 2021 winners. So these authors will also receive a letter of appreciation from our magazine and um, it will be a great experience for you. Now, um, why should you submit an article to our magazine? One, it will help you strengthen the learnings from this workshop. And secondly, a lot of students we've seen, they do not know what to write on. So you're getting a ready-made topic here to write on and a little bit more research. And finally, you have an article to write. So um, I, think, uh, I'm expect I think I should expect a lot of articles from you guys. And um, these are, this is our contact information. We have two student ambassadors in your college, that's Savni and Keshav. You can always connect with them if you have any queries. You can also email us on connect at the rate the biotalkmagazine.com if you have any doubt. And our website is pretty simple. It's just the biotalkmagazine.com. Just type it on Google and you'll be able to find us. So yeah, any questions for me? Thank you, Dr. D Ms. Dipakshi. Uh, any questions for her regarding submission? I would suggest that if you could share us the submission protocol, particularly to Savni, maybe she can get in touch with the students and uh, the submission steps, if she can share. Sure, ma'am, sure, I'll do that. Anyone has any questions to her? Or we can thank the speaker and uh, you may share the submission protocol. Yeah, yeah, no problem. With this, we are coming to the end of today's workshop event. Tomorrow again, we have very interesting events for you. That is citation five and multimode image analyzer uh, demonstrations, talk by application specialist. So hope to see you all again tomorrow with the same enthusiasm. I hope you have learned quite some, uh, quite a lot in this, these two sessions. That is session one and session two. And uh, I hope that you learn more in the upcoming sessions. Thank you so much for being here with us and for attending. I'll end today's session. Thank you all. Sir, I think we can end the session, please.